Good morning, everyone, and happy Friday. Um, welcome to today's edition of Changing the Way We Work, the COVID-19 Community of Practice for Ontario Family Physicians. Um, I'm Eleanor College. I'm a family physician. I work in East Toronto. I'm also the CPD Program Director at the Department of Family and Community Medicine. Um, and thrilled that we're able to continue to collaborate with the OCFP to bring you these sessions and uh, really excited for today's where we'll be going from everything from listeria to pertussis to RSV, you name it, we're bringing you lots of infectious disease. Uh, I'm going to turn it over now to our OCFP president, Dr. Mahali Kuminen, to open the session. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you're having a wonderful summer so far. Thank you for taking the time to join. Uh, we do have a great session lined up, and I'd like to take a moment to thank our speakers for being here with us. Um, and just a reminder that this is a main pro accredited session and details will follow by email. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to our land acknowledgement, we acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The OCFP and DFCM recognize that, that the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. The OCFP and DFCM respect that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite us all to reflect on the territories we're calling in from as we commit to gaining knowledge, forging a new culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. And I'm calling in from Kitchener, the lands traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Chinantin peoples. Thanks, Mahalay. And I'm calling in from Toronto, which are the lands traditionally used by the Wendat, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and in light of it being summer and perhaps people having a little bit of time to get away or explore new places, um, I was reflecting on the number of places and, and things that you can do within our province where you can learn more about our rich Indigenous heritage. And uh, one of the places that's on my bucket list for, for August when I have a few weeks off is to head to the Canadian Canoe Museum. This museum is uh, northeast of, of Peterborough, and uh, you can see on this slide a beautiful birch bark canoe, which is apparently uh, constructed by an elder from Mattawa uh, area. And then on the le left-hand side of the slide, you'll see an elder from Iqaluit, uh, who's part of a society called the Kiakut Society. Um, it's an Iqaluit-based society that's aiming to support and strengthen traditional um, birch bark and, or not birch bark, but kayak, kayak building. And uh, they were commissioned by the canoe to make, by the canoe museum to take to make a couple of uh, kayaks and uh, did so. And apparently, as part of that project, they also recorded um, the regionally specific Anukatuk language, pronouncing many of the words that uh, that are part of uh, boat building. Um, one of which is kayak, and which I understand is actually um, more closely pronounced as kayak or along those lines. Anyway, looking forward to visiting that museum. Uh, if you have any places that you're going to, or you've been to, where people can learn more about our our, here, uh, our Indigenous peoples, then please pop them in the chat. And otherwise, uh, we'll move on to the next slide, please. So just a reminder that today's session is part of uh, a whole series, and you can access those that you've missed uh, on online. Next slide, please. We've got a great uh, host of panelists today, uh, and we're going to introduce each of them now. And I'll turn things over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Zane Chagla. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me back. So I'm Zane Chagla. I'm an infectious disease physician at St. Joe's Healthcare in Hamilton, Assistant Professor at Master. My uh, conflicts of interest are, are noted here, uh, and, uh, and very happy to be here today. Thanks, Dr. Shadla and Dr. Wachowski. Hi, good morning, everybody. Always happy to be here. Uh, Daniel Wachowski, I'm on the Associate Chief Medical Officer of Health uh, in the Ministry of Health, and nothing to declare. And Dr. Mahali Kumanen. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahali Kumanen. I'm a family doc in Cambridge, and I'm currently serving as the president of the OCFP, which does not pose a conflict for today. And as I've already introduced myself, and I don't have any conflicts of interest, I do get an honorary from the OCFP. Next slide, please. So just a reminder, if you have any questions, which hopefully I'm sure you will, to put them in the Q&A function. If you see a question that you would like answered, then please upvote it so that I know to prioritize those questions with our speakers. 
And then of course, feel free to share your resources, your thoughts, your ideas um, with the, in the chat function. Next slide, please. Okay, let's get started. I'll turn things over to you, uh, Zane. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, so thanks for having me today. Uh, so we'll go through a few infectious disease updates, uh, including COVID-19, uh, Listeria and Pertussis. I, I'm not actually gonna talk about West Nile virus for the sake of time, but happy to answer questions uh, if, they, uh, if they come up. Next slide. So what's circulating now? Um, so we had a, uh, um, uh, going into the summer, we had a little bit of a rise in parainfluenza that seems to be coming down. Uh, we are seeing a rise in rhinovirus and enterovirus, and that typically peaks um, as kids back, get back to school in the second and third week. So very expected at this time. Um, and then COVID-19, which did reach a, a low uh, kind of in March, April of, of 2024, which is now starting to ramp up and not only in Ontario specific issue. This is starting to happen throughout North America. Next slide. Um, when we look at wastewater, again, things have been fairly steady for the past few months, but uh, the projected, and again, the gray area is uh, with some degree of error and pre preliminary estimates um, that uh, um, we are seeing a rise in wastewater positivity for COVID-19 signal, um, and then using outbreaks, which is often the marker of what's happening in the community, um, there are um, a number of outbreaks that are starting to increase in COVID-19 over the past uh, couple of weeks through July, um, and a little bit of uh, rhinovirus activity as well. Next slide. Uh, in terms of uh, current uh, variants that are circulating, the KP3 and KP23, as well as others, uh, are kind of the predominant, KP3 being the predominant, which is being thought to be uh, the reason for some of this rise. Um, these are all um, uh, derivatives of JN1, which is the strain used in the vaccine this year. So uh, theoretically still good protection from appropriate immunization. Next slide. Uh, so just quickly in terms of updates, in terms of COVID-19, testing is available through the Ontario.ca website for a number of pharmacies and testing centers. Rapid testing um, is available. Local public health unit websites really have distribution. Um, so uh, for those of you interested for your patients, uh, there are you know, a number of networks that still have distributions, either through pharmacies or otherwise. Um, therapeutics are still available for non-hospitalized patients. So Paxlovid is available via prescription or prim primary pharmacy-based prescribing. Um, the change uh, over the last couple of months has been the use of a limited use code, uh, as this has been brought out under the provincial formulary. So um, a number of limited use codes, depending on the indication, um, private insurance as well with coverage. And remdesivir is still available for those who have contraindications to Paxlovid. It's thought you know, more to be someone, the drug for people who can't take Paxlovid and are at high risk, uh, the big population being uh, organ transplants um, and, uh, and can be filled out through the Home and Community Care website. The forms are available there. And vaccines are coming. Their uh, current vaccines are still available that are XPB based in terms of Pfizer, Moderna, and Novavax. Um, and uh, likely kind of in the early fall of 2024, the launch of the JM1 based vaccines from the same manufacturers. Next slide. These are the NACI recommendations for vaccination coming into the fall. You'll see that there is a high emphasis on those who are at high risk. So anyone over um, anyone over 65, people with underlying medical conditions that put them at higher risk people who live in congregate living facilities, pregnant individuals, people from First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, and other racialized uh, equity-deserving services, people who provide essential community services. Um, for those who are not high risk, you know, the, the recommendation is that they may receive the vaccine. Um, so not as strong as a recommendation as prior years, really focusing the emphasis as uh, on the highest risk populations and obviously those who are unvaccinated that they should be uh, vaccinated, especially if they're considered high risk um, and uh, um, uh, uh, immunocompromised may receive an extra dose of vaccine as part of their primary vaccine series. Next slide. Moving on to Listeria, many are aware there was a large recall uh, due to Listeria contamination uh, in a number of brands of silk, oat, cashew, and uh, coconut milk, as well as almond milk, um, as well as um, some of the um, 
great value brands, uh, which are listed at the bottom. Uh, there's a specific lot number. These are the cartons, not necessarily the smaller boxes. Um, and so for those who are interested, the CFIA website has the exact lot numbers and expiry dates for these products. Uh, so so uh, if you do have a patient with a concern, feel free to go up there and, and verify it. Next slide. Just a reminder about Listeria, this is a gram-positive bacilli. It's found really in contaminated products, soil vegetation. It can also contaminate hands, and, and especially the food manufacturing process can get on countertops and equipment, which we've seen in outbreaks in the past. Um, it's acquired typically through ingestion other than maternal to child. Um, and the big concern about this organism, the reason why it causes a lot of problems, particularly in, in certain grocery store products is that it grows readily at four to 10 degrees, that refrigeration temperature. So those ready to made pro products that don't go through a cook process like cold cuts, we've had a, an outbreak that, uh, there many years ago and uh, hummus, there was an outbreak a few years ago and now in, in Odin and other plant-based milks, um, these are products that sit in the fridge. Uh, and, uh, and again, the, the organism can grow. The incubation period can be quite long, and it's important as we recognize as people are coming forward with exposures, the exposure risk can be up to 70 days after ingestion. So we are just seeing the recall now, but people may be incubating for some time. And there is a spectrum from asymptomatic disease to gastroenteritis to meningitis, um, and then the specific issues from maternal to child transmission in terms of preterm labor, septic abortion, and then sepsis and meningitis in the newborn. Next slide. So these are people at highest risk, and this goes into place in terms of what we do in terms of exposure. So pregnant individuals, um, their you know their their actual disease is quite limited, but uh, the uh, complications of spontaneous and septic abortion, preterm delivery, and stillbirth, as well as neonatal risks, really are the risks in that sense. Elderly individuals over the age of sixty. And then immunocompromised individuals uh, with underlying immunocompromising diseases or even diseases such as cancer, diabetes, and kidney disease. Next slide. So uh, many are being asked, what do I do? I have a patient that may have been exposed. Uh, they may have some diarrhea. You know, number one, stool is not an appropriate method for testing. It's actually low sensitivity. We have you know incremental shedding in the stool. And as uh, the lab processes stool cultures, they're very hard to process given that it's a, not a sterile site. There's other bacteria in there. It's not particularly helpful for clinical decision making. Um, but, you know, if you have someone presenting with gastroenteritis and risk factors, you may want to make sure that you're doing the typical stool tests for other stool pathogens to just, just to rule them out, considering there's a large exposure burden, but not necessarily everyone who um, ingested the product uh, develops listeriosis. Um, in those with moderate to severe symptoms, uh, where you're clinically concerned about their, their disease, blood cultures are the most appropriate test. They're not of super high sensitivity, but they would at least determine invasive listeriosis. And then CSF in those who have um, uh, meningitis, uh, uh, given that, that that's the diagnostic test. Next slide. So a lot of questions, and then certainly in my clinical practice, I've been getting a few questions around this. You know, first of all, reassurance that, you know, you know, if you have patients coming forward that they had the product in many of these outbreaks, there's a huge amount of exposure in the population, but very, very few people develop severe listeriosis. Right now, I believe across Canada, it's about nine or 10 cases with two fatalities. Um, but, you know, considering that product has been on the shelves for some time, there's probably been, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people that have had exposures. Um, if people are in those, not in those high risk categories um, that develop mild symptoms, that they can be just managed with expected management, similar to other gastroenteritis in terms of fluids and, and just self-resolving diarrhea. In um, non-pregnant high risk individuals, uh, we really, you know, look at disease burden. So again, if they're asymptomatic and exposed, expected management. If they're exposed and you're seeing them three weeks after they had symptoms, they're completely clinically resolved. There's really expected management at that point. If those, you know, uh, if people, uh, I'll skip to the last one, if people have febrile and moderate to severe symptoms, um, where they're ill, you know, febrile, looking unwell, then obviously the, the choice is to admit them, uh, do blood cultures as that's the appropriate test. Make sure that we're still considering other etiologies. Again, given the exposure burden to number of cases, um, it's important not to miss other etiologies. 
And the, the drug of choice is IV ampicillin, um, uh, which is uh, uh, renal function based. Uh, in people that are allergic, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole is the alternative. And then those with mild symptoms who are exposed and high risk, there's really a clinical decision. Like people could could consider expected management with, with close follow-up, um, or people could consider blood cultures and initiation therapy. People aren't sick enough to be in hospital, then oral amoxicillin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole um, are reasonable. I've been getting, you know, this is where I've been getting a lot of calls. And, and often these are well hydrated people looking well, but maybe 70. Um, and we usually just give the decision to, to do the blood cultures and give the amoxicillin in that case. Next slide. Uh, in pregnancy, very similar algorithms. So if they're you know not symptomatic, there's no testing. If uh, the patients are uh, um, individuals are febrile, then consider IV and ampicillin and uh, placental blood cultures if delivered. Um, uh, if they're not febrile but developing symptoms, really expected management, you may consider obtaining blood cultures to help with, especially in that late pregnancy phase, understanding risks to to newborn. Um, and then generally for the newborn uh, who are exposed uh, in that perinatal period or antenatal period, you know, it, it, there is not really a huge recommendation here, but it may be prudent to have close observation for that newborn to ensure they're not developing signs and symptoms of sepsis as they're going through the first week of life. Next slide. Um, I'm going to flip over to pertussis and just recognizing that, uh, that we are seeing a, a surge in pertussis based on the last few years um, and even towards the pre-pandemic range. So uh, the, the pandemic years have had kind of fairly normal pertussis. Last year was actually a fairly reasonable year. As you can see with the green bars that we've had a rise in pertussis over the last really couple of months um, with a number of small outbreaks. Um, the uh, the the about half the documented cases that have immunization status um, were unimmunized, um, and the majority of cases are those under the age of eighteen, particularly those under the age of fourteen. That ten to fourteen year old age group is really overrepresented again, maybe due to uh, uh, networks of individuals that are at high risk. Um, but just to recognize that you know we're seeing hundreds of cases here, so that you know there is theoretically. Uh, risk that someone does uh, show up to one of your practices with with pertussis type symptoms. Next slide. Just a reminder in terms of how it presents. This is typically uh, up to 21 day incubation, although typically around 10 days. You have kind of a typical upper respiratory tract phase in the first week or two, and then the characteristic whooping cough to the point where people are having coughing fits, nausea, subconjunctival hemorrhages, and vomiting from how bad the coughing is. Um, and that usually lasts three to six weeks, and then and then a convalescent phase thereafterwards, where people recover slowly. The diagnosis is made by nasopharyngeal PCR, and again, there are specific Bordetella pertussis PCR kits. Uh, so, um, you know, for those of you who have a, a person who uh, is suspect, please make sure you have the appropriate kit available, as other kits for respiratory viruses aren't validated and may result in false negatives. And then, you know, if you do have someone that, that is high risk and, and there may be delays, consider um, treatment. So uh, treatment is really effective in the first 21 days afterwards, really is an inflammatory and toxin-based effect. So uh, treatment really doesn't do that much. Um, but macrolides uh, are the standard and, and trimethoprim supplement is all in those who are um, allergic. Finally, prevention, you know, vaccination, make sure that vac you know kids are being vaccinated, that um, as people are getting their... Uh, tetanus vaccines that one adult dose is given as a with an acellular pertussis and then pregnant individuals again with every pregnancy between weeks 27 and 32 receiving a dose of vaccine to to give perinatal antibodies uh, for prevention i think that's my last slide Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Chagla, for taking us through all those topics. Um, so we have a couple of questions, well, quite a few questions up that uh, I we're going to break and do those, and then we'll move on to, to Dan's talk. Um, so some questions regarding the vaccine. So one question is, what is the effectiveness of the current vaccine against infection versus the one that's coming in the fall? Yeah, very good question. So obviously, you know, much of this is is retrospective, right? Like we we look retrospectively in terms of vaccine efficacy. It's hard to judge, you know, what the effectiveness of current vaccines that are coming in the fall because that's really just looking at how well they boost the immune system. 
um, at least, you know, this year's strains, even at times when they weren't, you know, there was a switch between XBB and JN1, which are slightly different. Um, there was still marked protection against hospitalization in some studies in the U.S., kind of 50 to 70 percent, despite, you know, prior infection and, and how many people have had COVID in high risk people. Um, the protection against infection, you know, was about 30 to 40 percent. It lasted about three ish months, three to six months. But, you know, again, this is the recognition in the new NACI guidance. We're really looking for that big protection against hospitalization, even in individuals that have had prior COVID. That, that there is still incremental benefits in these high-risk populations in that 50 to 70% range to, to reduce hospitalization. Great, thanks for clarifying that. Another question just in, around vaccines is, um, first of all, I guess some pharmacists <laughs> are telling patients uh, who are more than six months from their, la their last vaccine to not get it, but to wait until October. Um, and also a related question, is the recommendation still to wait three to six months post COVID or last vaccine for the next one? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a great question. I think, you know, given the epidemiology, their either option is reasonable. I think, you know, given that there may be a new vaccine that, um, uh, that really does match current strains, um, you know, it may be prudent for individuals who are kind of at six and seven months to, to just wait for that next vaccine to be more matched. That being said, there may be high risk populations, someone that's undergoing chemotherapy in a couple of weeks where any protection is better than no protection and getting started sooner was rather than later. The only other complicating thing is I think, you know, we typically see the rise in COVID in August and September. We are seeing the rise now. Um, and so, you know, in prior years, it would have been, you know, again, much more prudent to say wait till September because you're epidemiologically less likely to be exposed. You know, right now you're seeing a little bit more COVID activity. So, you know, again, it's it's patient preference. I don't think there's a, a great choice one way or another. Um, and the other um, uh, question about three to six months. Um, so um, uh, the minimum window is three months. The recommended window is six months. It's actually a lot of epidemiologic work suggesting in those prior vaccinated and prior infected populations who are high risk, the biggest bang for the buck is after six months or later. Um, but again, those very high risk populations, major immunocompromising states, frail and elderly, they may consider that three month window um, to get their additional protection. Great. Thanks very much for clarifying both the the timing and and when to when whether to wait until the fall or not. Um, staying on the topic of COVID vaccines, uh, a question re regarding testing for nasal spray COVID vaccines that prevent infection is that happening and at what stage is it at? Yeah, so these uh, these trials are recruiting. I know the one at McMaster quite well is uh, has been done through the Infectious Disease Research Institute. So. Um, they're still kind of going through phase two, three right now. Um, they're, you know, um, you know, funded and moving along. There's an excellent group of researchers, at least, that are moving through this. I will say, you know, to get to market, there's still a number of different steps. The device needs to be actually made into a way that's accessible for individuals. Right now, they're using a fairly experimental device. Um, but, you know, at least some of the phase one data and the preclinical data look really promising, but um, I would say probably years before um, we see this on the market. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to wait to not have to do the jab still. <laughs> um, another question that's come up and uh, is what do we know about the effects of repeated multiple COVID, COVID infections? Um, and I would say just related to that, there's been a couple of uh, questions around, you know, seeing things in our practice like thyroiditis or prediabetes in younger patients and wondering whether those could be at all related to COVID. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of, again, retrospective cohorts that are suggesting, you know, links to things like prediabetes or diabetes type 1, diabetes, autoimmunity, autoimmune disease. You know, I think we do know that viruses can be triggers for autoimmune phenomenon, and so COVID is probably the most virus, you know, in the last case and epidemiologically linked. Um, we do know, you know, that nest infections in terms of risk of severity are usually lower. That being said, you know, even in influenza, RSV, and other viruses, it's usually not the first infection that lands older people in hospital. It's it's their 10th or 15th infection that lands them in hospital. So the risk isn't necessarily zero on the second infection. Um, you know, there is a slightly 
an incremental risk of post-acute COVID syndrome, not that it increases the risk, but you know, having two infections is worse than one infection in terms of post-acute COVID symptom risk. And again, I think we we know certain viruses can trigger autoimmunity and other phenomenon. And I think we've we've been able to track COVID to a number of these. And and so, you know, there there may be some effects in that sense. Okay, thanks very much, Zane. One other question regarding the COVID vaccine, which I think you've already answered, but will there be a new COVID vaccine in the fall, which from what you've told me there will be? And when will university students living in residence be eligible for it? I mean, that, that really it depends on when it's coming. Uh, so yes, it will be available in the fall of the Jan 1, um, depending on supply, you know, typically in the last few years, it's been September, early October. Um, the, you know, again, the, the, the emphasis is going to be in those higher risk populations. I don't think there's going to be exclusion of lower risk populations in terms of being able to access it. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, given the rush and usually in terms of trying to get it, it usually will be, you know, a couple of weeks delayed for lower risk populations through publicly funded services, but, you know, available in that that context. I can probably jump in on that one quickly. Yeah, one great, okay. great, good. Um, yeah, I'm, everything they said exactly right. Like the timing, we don't know exactly when deliveries will come for COVID this year, but it'll be similar to last year. October will be our high risk month. So long-term care homes, hospitals, older adults, that sort of thing. So for, you know, kids and university residents, it'll be November along with the general population. That's probably what we'll see. Again, it, you know, it all kind of depends as, as they mentioned when we get authorization of the new strain and, and when then it can arrive. So just waiting to hear still. Great, thanks, uh, Dan and Zane for tag teaming that one. Um, moving on to pertussis, question about how often should we offer Tdap to healthy adults in addition to pregnant women? So I, the, the current recommendation is as you're doing tetanus and diphtheria or TD kind of boosts, so that Q10 years boost, one of those should be an acellular pertussis vaccine. So really, as long as you're covering that once, and it may be the first time you give you know, a, a, a university-aged individual their, their tetanus update that you give them Tdap instead of TD, um, that's it. But uh, but yeah, it's really that that one dose through adulthood uh, the, of the tetanus shot that gets converted over. Great, thanks very much. Another question, um, switching now to Listeria. Um, for moderately ill individuals with possible listeriosis, how do you recommend getting blood cultures, um, i.e. hospital or outpatient lab, which uh, this person, Mary T., has never done? Wondering more about logistics of getting these done in individuals who are at risk but not sick enough to be admitted. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can speak from personal experience. I do a ton of blood cultures through Life Labs and, and Dynacare. So they they absolutely have microbiology labs that can handle blood cultures. Many of my colleagues are, you know, in the academic setting or the medical microbiologists in those settings. So if you want to send people to community labs, that's great. You know, again, the clinical assessment is really what determines people should be coming to hospital or not. But, but uh, you know, getting blood cultures can be done in, in health sciences centers, but can also be done in community laboratories as well. Great. Thanks very much. I think and through, we'll just, sorry, just to mention, they're just normally on an OHIP requisition, just put blood cultures that's due. And again, they, they'll, they'll accept that. Yeah. Great. Yes. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I know we had a lot of discussion in our clinic about how it could be ordered. So good to know it can just be sent through Life Labs. Um, I think what we might do now, actually, because there's quite a few questions also related to things like RSV, um, perhaps we'll turn over to you, Dan, to do your presentation, and then we'll have time to get to both sets of questions again at the end. Thanks very much. Thanks, Eleanor. Yeah, happy to jump in. So the two things I'm going to cover today, one is the updates, the pneumococcal program um, with the changeover in products. So I think most people are aware of. And then uh, just yesterday, the news release went out about the uh, changes to our RSV infant program for this fall. And so I'm going to go over that one as well. So you can, there we go. That's what's what we're covering. We can jump to the next slide. Um, so quickly to start off with our pneumococcal program, um, you know, the, the main outcome we're looking at is invasive pneumococcal disease, you know, severe pneumonias, bring people into hospital. Um, that's what we're trying to prevent. This is just quickly showing which, which age groups we see that in. Um, and so as you can see, like the, the highest rates are still in the over 65 population. That's the, the biggest risk, but then the under fives are not that far behind, uh, in terms of risk. So this is really the, you know, the, the younger and older populations are who are trying to protect with this vaccine, which is why you see it in, in infancy. And then obviously again, for older adults, uh, next slide, please. <laughs> 
So just quickly, um, the two new products that were authorized by Health Canada recently were the PCV15 by Merck and the PCV20 by Pfizer. As a quick graph just showing which strains are covered by the different products. So the PCV13 or the Prevnar 13 was one we all know very well for years now. Um, the 15 and the 20 products are incremental improvements over that one, basically covering all the same strains and then adding a few more. The PVV23 is most of the same, but slight differences in terms of the final ones they're covering. Um, the other difference is that the PPV is a polysaccharide vaccine. The other ones are conjugated. The polysaccharide vaccines don't provide the same level of protection as the conjugated vaccine. So, um, you know, the, the protection does not last as long and it's not quite as effective as the conjugate vaccine. So those are definitely preferred products if we have them. Uh, next slide. Uh, so just to show for, again, for those older adults over 65, um, what are the serotypes we actually see in Ontario? And you can see that, you know, moving ahead and moving to uh, the 15 or 20 products are going to cover a significant number of additional cases of invasive pneumococcal disease uh, beyond what's already covered right now in the 13 and the, the 23 products. Um, so we are going to see a benefit from having those. So next slide, please. And we will. Um, so briefly to, to cover, so we have both the 15 and the 20 products that are going to be available uh, starting as of Monday, uh, July 29th. Uh, so it's a switch over in the products right now. We'll be changing. We will no longer be having either the PCV13, the Prevnar 13, or the PPV23 products. It's a switch over to the 15 and the 20 instead. So if we can jump to the next slide just to show um, as a very high level here and, you know, in the guidance documents and details that have gone out, there's multiple, multiple charts. So for anyone who has particular risk conditions, different variations of how many vaccines they've gotten so far um, from the 13 or 23, that kind of clarifies what additional to give them at a very high level. Any of the, you know, low risk children, so kids under five who don't have a medical condition that's making them high risk. The PCV15 is the product that's recommended for that group. That's consistent with the NASI recommendations uh, and that the PCV15 or 20 could either be offered to that population. For all other groups that are high risk and older adults, the PCV20 is the product that we're going to have going forward. Uh, again, consistent with the NASI recommendations. At this point in time, and just to emphasize, so right now it's just a changeover in products, but there's no change in the eligibility um, that we had so far. So NASI did look at some other populations and recommendations to expand to other high risk groups. Um, those are still under review uh, at the province. We'll expect to see those expansions probably coming up next year. For this year, it's just individuals who are either haven't started their series or are completing a series are going to be using the new products for those purposes. Uh, next slide, please. So that was the rapid whirlwind one for, uh, for pneumococcal changes. Again, big picture is low risk kids get the 15 now. Everybody else gets the 20. Um, and that's going to provide us much better protection than the products that we had previously. So I'll dive into the RSV prevention programs we have for this fall. It's going to take a little bit longer, um, but just to start with what we actually see. Um, so this is looking at last year and the year before's data in terms of hospitalizations, number of beds that were taken up over the RSV season. Uh, the RSV season, you know, it's called every year by our provincial RSV advisor group when the start and stop is generally start seeing increases in mid to late October and runs through into, you know, early to mid March. Um, and you can see here that where the peaks are again, two years ago was that really bad year. It was the no one had had RSV for several years because of COVID. And we got a huge bump in terms of cases and hospitalization as a result of that with really high counts of hospitalization, um, particularly in kids as well. Last year was much more of a standard year uh, in terms of numbers. But as you can see, this is still a significant burden to the system. There's a lot of beds that are taken up every year from RSV in hospitals. Uh, next slide, please. So just to show the difference between the under fives and the over 65, and those are again, the predominant groups that we see hospitalizations as a result of RSV. Uh, the under fives, we tend to see that peak first. That's usually in late November, early December, and that's the peak for the pediatric season. And then we see it drop down fairly quickly after that point. If we can go to the next slide, you'll see that the peak for individuals 65 and older is about a month after that. So that season that spreads out and looks fairly steady across is really two peaks in the different age groups that we're seeing with an overlap. You know, kids get it. They then hang out with their parents and grandparents. Then their grandparents get it later on, more or less. Um, and that 65-year-old one does tend to, you know, fade a little bit further out into March and last a little bit longer. So next slide, please. Um, so in terms of the programs that we have, last year was the first year that we had an RSV vaccine available for older adults. Um, it was the Orexi product that we had last year. 
Um, we've had the Synergist program. So that's using a monoclonal antibody, passive immunity to last the season. That's been for you know decades now that we've had that program. Um, but there's new products that have been authorized and that's the Bayfortis or Sanofi product. Um, so in terms of what we'll have this year, um, the older adult program is going to be, it's actually a Brisvo is the product that we have for this year. So it's authorized both in older adults and for pregnant individuals. Uh, and then the passive program this year for infants is switching over from Synergis to Bayfortis to the newer product. So next slide. Uh, quickly talk about the older adult program. Last year, it was uh, covered for everyone in long-term care homes, elder care lodges, uh, and the host of you know other conditions below, alternate level of care, dialysis, transplant patients, indigenous population, um, as well as a select group of retirement homes. This year, uh, there will be an expansion of the program to residents of all retirement homes. Um, that's really the change for, for this year. Um, NASI did just come out with their recommendations that are talking about a more population level. It, frankly, it's far too late to implement that in, in the province, just in terms of timing when that recommendation came out. That'll be looked at for next year, whether it can be covered for you know community dwelling individuals that aren't falling into these categories. Um, but for this year, it's really residents of retirement homes. That's the additional uh, group. So next slide, please. Uh, timing is still TBD a little bit, but hoping for an August start um, based on when the rest of the supply comes in so that we can begin in some of those highest risk locations, particularly long-term care homes in August. Um, so as a reminder, so for the RC vaccine, this is not a yearly vaccine. And NASI reiterated this in their statement. We're seeing at least two years of protection, up to three in some studies, and, and potentially even more. So we're following this closely. It's not something people need to be getting every year to boost. We see very good protection at least two years um, and probably longer. Uh, in terms of who's going to be giving out, again, these are you know select populations. Long-term care homes are doing their own administration predominantly. Healthy nurses are supporting with some of those high-risk groups. Um, the main difference for this year will be we'll probably see a little bit more in primary care for those you know, re residents of retirement homes. Um, so if you have those residents who are coming to see you, just be ordering it through your local public health unit as with your other vaccine products. Next slide. Okay, so here's the, the money stuff that was interesting in getting into the infant program this year. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll have the two different products available for infant protection this year. One is Bayfortis, that's the monoclonal antibody, and the other is Abrizo, which is a vaccine administered in pregnancy. Um, NASI made it very, very clear that Bayfortis is the preferred product for infant protection this year. Um, it's more effective than a Brizzo from we saw in the studies um, and better safety uh, signals that we saw. So there was a, a very small signal, not statistically significant in the studies, but watched for for premature birth um, from the Brizzo vaccine, still being watched. But again, the Bayfortis product looks better. That's going to be the main product used this season. Um, it's a single dose. It's uh, even though it's a monoclonal antibody, it's very similar to vaccines that we're used to in terms of administration. So it comes in a pre-filled syringe. It's stored at two to eight degrees in your normal fridge temperature. It's an intramuscular injection. So, you know, all those normal things that we do for vaccines, it's similar for Bayfortis. In terms of who will be getting it this year, um, any infant born in 2024 uh, prior to the RSV season is eligible. Anyone born during the RSV season, again, that's from, from the start, October, November through until the end of the season in March is eligible. And then as per the Synergist criteria, those same high-risk groups that were eligible for Synergist will remain eligible for Bayfortis as well, you know, individuals up to up to two and, and some potentially older. Um, Abrisvo is going to be available. Again, it's not recommended, so it's much smaller supply that's available for this one. It's really meant to be given to pregnant individuals who are refusing to get nirsevimab for, for their infant or, or can't for whatever reason. Um, it's a little bit more difficult. It's a, it's a tight window to give it. It's from 32 to 36 weeks gestation. Um, so even tighter than the Tdap in pregnancy. And again, that's not the preferred product. Um, next slide, please. So just a, a quick rundown. So again, the, the, the monoclonal antibody is different than the vaccine. So it's not providing active immunity. It's not stimulating your immune system. Um, it's providing you passive protection. What we've seen from the studies that we have for before is so our last six months, we're very confident in that at this point in time, um, potentially longer, you know, it was used last year and we're starting to get some better studies on how long it's lasting, maybe eight months, maybe even longer than that, but very confident that six months protection to cover the season. But again, it also means that we should be giving it pretty close to the start of the season to ensure you're covered for the entirety of the season. Um, the vaccine, again, it's active immunity, but that active immunity is for the pregnant individual. It's still passive immunity that's being passed on to the infant. 
um, through you know maternal antibodies. Those also look to last about six months. So the protection in terms of length of time from each is the same. The main difference is that you know the, the monoclonal, they're getting it right away. Um, whereas an active vaccine, it takes a little bit of time to get that immune response. Again, for the infant program, it's still passive immunity from both either products for the infant themselves. Uh, next slide. This is just a quick run through of who's still remaining high risk this year. So this is the list of high risk infant uh, conditions. Um, you know, Down syndrome is probably the most common one that we see. The other ones are, are fairly uh, more rare conditions like you know, significant lung disease, pulmonary disease, sig hemodynamically significant heart disease. Um, these are ones where, again, the vast majority of these kids are gonna be followed outside of the Down syndrome patients um, by a specialist, a pediatric specialist for most of these conditions. Um, so if you do have questions, that's really like likely who's going to be recommending it for any particular infant or, or child up to this age group. Uh, next slide. So who's going to be given out these products? Um, so for all infants that are born in hospital during the start of the, during the RSV season, so once it starts and declared and we have product available, um, and so we're, we're still waiting for confirmed timelines of product, but likely sometime in mid-October. Um, everybody born in hospital should be getting it in the hospital prior to discharge. We have roughly 135-ish thousand births in Ontario a year. So, you know, for the six months of the RSV season, we should be getting about half infants um, getting that in hospital before the discharge. We do see a number of uh, infants born outside of hospital every year, uh, either birthing centers or home births. That is relatively small numbers. It's about five-ish thousand infants. Um, and then, of course, there's all of the infants born prior to the season. For those groups, it'll be coming back mostly to a primary care provider to get that dose administered. Um, local public health will be doing it in some areas, but it's it's variable across the province how much public health does for routine child immunization. It's still mostly primary care providers who are doing this. And so really, it's it's a, a huge thanks I have to everybody on this call um, for, for the work that's going to happen this year in terms of getting all of these infants who are under one and, you know, born prior to the season to get them back in uh, to get their nercefimab product so they can be prevented um, from getting RSV. Again, it can be given during the routine childhood vaccines at the exact same time at the two, four, six, one visits. That's totally safe to do. We're very confident in that one. Um, so that's that's realistically what we expect most to do. For some where it doesn't line up necessarily great, it may be someone that you might want to call back for it. Um, again, for those infants who are in their second RSVCs in high-risk conditions, a lot of this will probably be done through some of the pediatric specialists. There's an RSV coordination network that exists for synergists for years that has been identifying these kids, and we'll be looking at those those um, those same groups again for them as well. Uh, again, a Brizzo vaccine, not preferred, but midwives, obstetricians, primary care providers, anyone of those groups providing obstetrical care can administer Brizzo if that's the, the patient's preference and they aren't going to be getting their cephamap. Um, there are, again, the last thing I'll say, so for those high-risk infants that I mentioned before, even if the mother gets uh, a Brisvo, they're still recommended to get nirsivimab if they're high risk with those conditions. Um, that's the, the NASI recommendation to make sure they're the best possible protection for the season. Next slide. Um, I want to share this slide just because I think it's a great summary of how good this product is and what we might see for the season. Um, so this is uh, in Europe and the US last year, nirsivimab was used. So we have really good real world data now to back up the studies. Uh, and, you know, very consistent with the studies in terms of effectiveness. So the different colors here are, so the purple is just at an individual level, the effectiveness, the effectiveness of the product, someone who got nirsevimab versus did not. Um, we saw great effectiveness, and this is against hospitalization primarily um, for the purple. So it's anywhere from 80 to 90% effective at, uh, at reducing hospitalizations uh, from RSV. So that's like phenomenal numbers. Uh, the red is ICU admissions. And again, we still saw very high effectiveness reducing ICU admissions. Um, the, the green is an interesting one. This is at the population level. How much reduction in hospitalization did they see compared to years where they didn't have nirsevimab? And you can see that we saw anywhere from 70 to 90% reduction in overall hospital visits from RSV during the season from having good uptake of nirsevimab. Um, the uptake, I really want to emphasize. So Spain had like 95% of the kids got nirsevimab and they saw that huge decrease in hospitalization as a result. So getting as many kids nirsevimab as possible is what we really need to do to see that decrease in hospital visits over the season. But if we can get really good uptake, 
we'll see, you know, the, the pediatric surge things that we saw two years ago will be significantly attenuated. And, you know, if we do great, maybe not even a surge this year. So um, it really is an exciting product for us to have. And we're really, really hoping that that patients are willing to get it and that everybody's able to administer it. I think that's the last slide I had. Thanks, Eleanor. You're still muted, Eleanor. Got to do that once a year anyway. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, lots of information to take in there. And as a result, uh, plenty of questions. Um, so let's get to those. I'm just going to pull them up here. Um, so just going to back up to talk a little bit about uh, the Prevnar changes. Um, so a few questions around that. So first of all, if a patient got Pneumovax already, do they still qualify for Prevnar 20, OHIP covered? And should we recommend it even if they have to pay for it? Yeah, so it, it wouldn't be OHIP covered yet if they completed all the recommended doses. So uh, we're not doing a catch-up program for it yet for individuals who did that. Um, the NASI recommendation said that if it's been less than five years since you got either Pneumovax or Prevnar, you don't need one of the new products either. So if you have patients who are outside that five years, they, it, that would potentially be recommended. They would have to pay for out-of-pocket at this point. That catch-up and then the expanded populations will be something coming in, in 2025. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. Another question around, uh, around the dosing in those over 65. If you've had Prevnar 13, when should you boost with Prevnar 20? And will it be covered if you're over 65? Yeah, so kind of the same answer again. Again, if, if it's been in the last five years, you don't need to. Um, per NASI, and it wouldn't currently be covered for any catch-up. Um, that's the next year when it will be covered for, for those catch-up populations who did get it and are now also outside of that five-year window. Okay. So just to, to clarify, anybody that's gone through the series already basically is not, you're not catching them up and giving them PCV20. It's just if they're starting now. Yeah. Starting new or, or didn't complete all the recommended doses. Okay, perfect. Um, question, I guess, uh, from, from Jenny, like, why aren't we just giving Prevnar 20 to everybody? It seems like that might be a simple answer. To, yeah, to it's, it's a great question. Um, so I, I, I encourage people to read the NASI statement. They basically said that either the 15 or 20 for low risk kids would, would be equivalent in terms of the effectiveness of the program and the cost effectiveness. So that's, that's really why that's the NASI recommendation. Um, whether that changes, whether we learn more, I, I don't know. Um, but it's something we'll be going forward with and seeing if we maybe move to a full 20 program. Per, you know, personally, it'd be nice to have 20 because it's easier to only have one product that we're using for everybody. Um, but this is just following the NASI recommendations at this point. Great. Thanks for clarifying that. It, it is nice to only have two products now rather than three. Anyway, we're, we're getting closer to one. We're getting closer, yeah. <laughs> um, another question, just if an infant has started their vaccine series with the Prevnar 13, do we just switch over to Prevnar 15 for the remaining doses? Yep, exactly. Yep. Uh, and then a question is PCV government, PCV 20 government funded, which I think you have answered, but maybe just to clarify that. Yeah, so it's funded for, again, as I said, so any high-risk infants and then any of the adult high-risk populations and older adults over 65, PCV20 is, is our funded product. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excellent. Uh, another a question regarding um, the schedule. So the question is, can you please clarify the newly funded Vax Nuvance schedule for kids? For the scenario where we have a new infant with no prior vaccine history, Table 3 states to give Vax Nuvance as follows, one dose at greater than two, second dose two months later, third dose two months after the second dose, and at age greater than 12 months. This is confusing. Does this mean three or four doses? Yeah, sorry. I know it's it's, it's hard to figure out how to worthy. So it, it is three doses. All I was trying to say is that that third dose has to be after the child is over a year. That's to give the, the longer lasting protection that we see and at least two months from the second dose. So if, you know, if you're following kind of the standard routine visit schedule, that's what you would end up doing. But sometimes people give doses early, they're concerned about potential exposures. So it's to make sure that you're following the minimum intervals of two months and third dose has to be given after they're a year old. Great, thanks for sorting that out. Another question um, regarding kids and Prevnar. If a child with asthma has had their Prevnar 13 series, 
and they're now five, should they get a dose of the Prevnar 15? Yeah, so the, the asthma high-risk criteria, again, if they've completed all the recommended doses at this point, no, it wouldn't be getting an additional dose. If they're still going through the series, then yes. Um, but, you know, the high-risk criteria for asthmas are now are people who are essentially you know, on getting hospitalized as a result of asthma um, or on, you know, high-dose corticosteroids for it. So it's a very narrow group. Um, that's being looked at, again, because the NASI language was a bit broader. And so it's really looking to see who's the best suited population, but that's more to come next year. Great, thanks very much for that. Just turning over to um, RSV, a question from Jane, will Arexi be covered by OHIP at some point? I think you t spoke about the expansion of the criteria, but maybe you can just speak to that. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, uh, so Arexi and Abrizo are both the both uh, Health Canada authorized for older adults. This year, Abrizo is the product that we'll have. Um, it's covered for those select groups. So long-term care home residents, retirement home residents, patients in hospital and ALC, dialysis, immunocompromised indigenous patients, uh, or people experiencing homelessness. It's not covered for the broad population as of yet. That's again, something still to be reviewed for, for future seasons. Great, thanks for that. So a question regarding Bay Fortis. Um, is the Bay Fortis one shot and how to add to the usual vaccines in Vexero? I think you had suggested we could just add it to the two, four and six, but to, Maybe yeah. That. yeah, it absolutely can be co-administered with any of the other ones. It's more a question of how many needles is our parents comfortable giving their kids on one visit, um, but you can do it at the exact same time. The Bay Fortis is a single dose. The only exception being, um, since it is weight-based, it's again, it's passive antibodies, you need to make sure they have enough. If a kid is older, you know, we're talking about the kids who are in their second season going to be two or three, um, they might need two doses based on their weight. So the details, like the weight-based details are in there. For anybody under one, it's just a single dose. The difference would be if they're if they're very young. So under five kilos is, is the 50 milligrams. Over five kilos is the 100 milligram dose. And it's just based on their age and weight. Okay, great. That's good to understand. And uh, there was a question, do I understand every infant gets Bay Fortis, not just high risk? The answer to that is yes, right? Yes, yes, please. Every infant born in 2024 and through the RSV season should get Bayfortis. Great. And can we order Bayfortis in our office in the same way that we order routine vaccines? Yes, absolutely. So it'll be the same ordering process through your local public health units. And just to clarify from Jenny, so if they're in their second year and not high risk, they don't need a second dose. That's right. Only those high risk conditions would be getting another dose. So the th this is really based on the risk of hospitalization. The risk is particularly kids under one, especially under three months. Once you get over one, the risk decreases hugely. And so you don't really need another one for your next season unless you have those high risk conditions. Right. Uh, so I'm going to flip you back to Prevnar for a minute. Is there yeah. a booster needed for Prevnar 20 for high risk or the general population? Or is it just a one dose? Yeah, so it's it's the same schedule as before at this point. So no change in the schedule and timing. So again, for the high risk, depending on condition, there might be multiple more doses if you're immunocompromised, et cetera. So I just encourage you to, to double check the schedule for your particular patient. Um, they may need additional doses depending on what their risks are. Okay, great. And I'm going to jump you back, sorry, to RSV. So yeah. is... Nersivimab going to be available in our family medicine clinics? Or it, I know you said it was going to be in the hospitals, um, but will also be available to us? It, it will absolutely, yep. So it'll be all hospitals will have supply for infants born in hospital. And then for, for primary care providers, you just order it through your local public health unit, same as you would any of your other vaccines. Great. And just clarifying that if a mom gets a Brisvo when pregnant, you had mentioned that the infant should still get the Bay Fortis and uh, pregnant women only get the Brisvo at 30 to 32 to 36 weeks. Is that correct? Yes, it's 32 to 36 weeks. Again, it's it's not the recommended product. They, the best would be to cancel them. They should be getting Bay Fortis for their infants once born. Um, if they got a Brisvo, then the infants don't need Bay Fortis unless they are in that high risk group. So you know, kids with Down syndrome, kids with, you know, significant lung disease, significant heart disease, then NASI says that, yes, they should still get before us as well because the protection is better. But again, the, the best choice is, it, it, you know, counsel your patients. They don't need a Brisvo. They should be getting before us for their infants. 
Okay. And I think actually along those lines, Rosemary was mentioning parents are often suspicious of new vaccines this day, these days. Um, what are you expecting might be side effects or are there any post-marketing adverse effects that have shown up? Yeah, I, again, in the studies, there were there was nothing sig really significant. Again, apart from Brizzo, I mentioned that small potential at risk of premature birth, um, but otherwise very similar to other vaccines immunizations that we have. You know, there's always a risk of local reaction. There's always a, a risk of you know fever for a short time, those sort of things. But no severe events were seen in the studies. And again, last year, we had that global data from the US and Europe, and we did not see any increased signal for any significant outcomes from Bayfortis in those jurisdictions where you know hundreds of thousands or millions of doses were administered. So we're, we're very confident in the safety of these products. That's good to hear that there are not a lot of side effects showing up because it certainly doesn't help when there are. Um, just in terms of the RSV, just clarifying if the mom gets RSV in pregnancy, we still give the monoclonal vaccine to the baby at birth. R RSV infection? I think, yeah, I think she means if, uh, Jenny, maybe do you want to clarify that? But I think you mean that if they get the RSV um, vaccine during pregnancy, will you give the monoclonal vaccine to the baby at birth? Yeah, so if they get a Brisvo in pregnancy, then the infant doesn't need Bayfortis unless they are also high risk. Okay. Um, in terms of Prevnar, can we give Prevnar 20 to diabetic patients instead of Pneumovax, regardless of their age? Yeah, uh, yeah so the, again, that that's the new product. We're getting rid of the Pneumovax 23. It's moving over to the Prevnar 20. And so that's the product for high risk populations now. Great. Um, so I think you answered this about Arexvi. Uh, if patients have had one dose, do they need another dose and uh, of the vaccine and which one and when? If they had the Arexvi last year. Yeah, good question. So again, the, the studies we've seen so far on both Arexvi and Abrizo are that no, um, this lasts more than a season, at least two seasons, potentially three or four even, we're, we're still following along to see. So if they did get a Rexvi last year, they don't need another dose of a Rexvi or a Brisvo this year. Okay, great. Um, can you just clarify again regarding the RSV, who needs to get it in their second year? Yes, and so I will, the, you know, the, all the slides are to share. So for, for second year kids, it's really, it's high risk populations. It's It should be relatively small numbers. So it's either, you know, infants with severe compromising lung disease um, with uh, cyanotic or significant heart conditions with Down syndrome, price me 21. Um, and then there's, you know, either significant neuromuscular disorders. And again, really talking ones that might impair breathing, things like that, um, or severe immunocompromise. Um, so those are really, the, you know, the, the more details are in the document, but it's, it's a, should be a relatively small number of infants who are really quite unwell. And the majority of these would likely be followed by a pediatric specialist for those conditions. Great. All right. Thanks, Dan. Um, Zane, I might also bring you up for this question because it's actually not specifically related to the topics we've had today, but are there any public health recommendations regarding the meningitis B vaccine for kids headed to university in the fall? So I don't know if either of you want to tackle that one. I I can start and Zane jump in. Um, yeah, correct. So, uh, um, you know, in Ontario, meningitis B vaccine isn't isn't covered outside of those highest populations, um, and it's not currently covered for you know standard risk university age kids going in the fall. Um, with that said, you know, other jurisdictions in Canada do have programs for those populations, particularly out east, where they see quite a lot of meningitis B, much more than we see here, frankly. Um, would I recommend it to students going to university? I would still, um, but again, with the caveat that it's it's not currently covered by OHIP unless they have some of the other risk conditions. Oh, Zane, if you want to add anything. Yeah, no, I would say that. And I think there has been some activity in Kingston with men B. So, so you know, it's not just specifically to Eastern uh, Canada in that sense. Great, thanks very much for that. Um, so just wondering also regarding COVID vaccine, um, are there gonna be any plans in terms of publicly public health running clinics for COVID vaccines for kids less than five? Um, I guess some pharmacies are doing it. 
I think there's a question perhaps for you, Dan, in terms of, of where you can access COVID vaccines if you have a child. Yeah, it'll it'll be the same locations as last season. So some public health units, um, you know, they've all been strongly encouraged to offer if they can. Mostly that's more to unattached patient populations predominantly, uh, people who don't have access to healthcare otherwise. But certainly um, having it available for kids under five through public health is one thing we're encouraging. Pharmacists can administer to kids down to six months of age. It's it's really pharmacist dependent even though. So a pharmacy may one day be doing it and the next day not because that pharmacist isn't there and isn't the one who's there isn't comfortable. So it is still a little bit more difficult to, to find potential for the kids in that age range. The one thing we can say is, and Zane appreciate you jump in too, like we aren't seeing the risks in kids in that age range with COVID as we do with things like flu or RSV. Um, so flu, absolutely kids under five or high risk should get it. RSV, you know, we're spending all this time talking about it. We don't see those same risks for hospitalization, severe outcomes in kids under five. So it's it's less urgent for that population to get it. But again, Zane, if you want to throw in on that one. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think the nasty statement really is is said like the 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 focus is high risk, right? Like the focus is these high risk individuals. Um, that you know, lower risk individuals are a may consideration rather than a, a should consideration in that sense. Great. Thanks for clarifying those points. Um, one thing somebody had mentioned that might be a nice, if there was a handout for all the vaccines that would, would help us, because there are a lot of changes happening right now. I don't know if that's something you know is in the works, Dan. We, we, I mean, we have a lot of documents going to the ministry, but maybe OCFP would also like to make a quick one pager, if I might suggest. <laughs> Great idea. Um, another question just around the, the, administration of Bay Fortis and hospitals. Um, do you know if there's going to be a strategy for the documentation um, coming to us within family practice clinics? Yeah, really good question. This is something that's still being worked on. Um, so doses given in hospital will be able, will be put into the born data system that we have, um, the, the Better Outcome Registry Network that we have. I um, think I got the acronym right. But born will be uh, tracking all the doses administered in hospital. It'll be on the discharge summary, and we're hoping that you know multiple routes then to get that information to primary care providers, letting the patient and the provider know that they had it. At the same time, I would still encourage you to ask uh, your patients just to confirm again, because this year it's still going to be a new thing, and we want to make sure that there's multiple redundancies in place that that everybody's gotten their dose. Great, thanks very much. Um, just a question regarding. Um the Abrisvo and Bay Fortis. Is there an additional benefit to receiving both Abrisvo in utero and Bay Fortis later? There's not that we've seen. And that's why the NASI recommendations say that if you got Abrisvo, you don't need to get Bay Fortis. Again, the difference is those highest risk populations, Bay Fortis protection is better than Abrisvo. So we really, really want them to have the best possible protection for those high risk groups. But otherwise, the, the passive immunity you get from either one are, is is very effective. And so you don't see additional benefits from both. Great. Um, and one last question, any benefit for patients who, and I think we did chat about this a bit before, any benefit for patients that are less than 65 who have Prevnar 13 to go and get the 20, even if they have to pay for it out of pocket? Or are you saying if it's been within five years, then not necessarily? Yeah, yeah. The NASA recommendations are if it's within five years, um, that you probably still have very good protection. Again, they would have gotten either 13 or 23 products at some point. Um, it's really outside those five years, we see more of the waning from the 23 um, protection already. And then the benefit of the additional doses really starts to increase. So if even if you're if you're outside those five years, that's what we're recommending for those populations to get it still. Great. Thanks very much. I think we're going to just stop there because um, I see we're coming up to nine o'clock and I thank you both Dan and Zane for answering the many questions. Um, and if we just bring the slides back up again. Uh, so I just wanted to let people know this is really just an update. Um, I think back in January, we had a session on, on the Ontario breast screening program changes. Um, and those are going to be coming into effect in the fall of 2024. This is what we know so far. Um, that current state, you know, as we know, is the OBSP program is for those 50 to 74. And then coming up in um, the fall, it's going to be uh, expanded to those in the 40 to 49, and they'll be able to self-refer. 
Uh, I don't have a lot more details at the moment. We just want to give you a heads up about this and also let you know that there will be resources coming through from um, the OBSP through the OCFP uh, upcoming in the next week or two uh, with like a summary of the screening recommendations, a conversation guide, as well as a frequently asked document, questions document. Next slide, please. I'll turn things to Mahalay for this one. Yeah, thanks, Eleanor. Um, just a, a quick reminder about OCFP supports for mental health addictions and chronic pain. Um, we have our community of practice coming up with a number of sessions through July and September, um, including on burnout, uh, supporting patients through the opioid crisis and diagnosing ADHD in primary care. And we also have our Peer Connect mentoring program um, that is tailored to support you to help um, manage some of those challenging cases um, in your practice. And just a reminder that there's, you can always look up our recent sessions. If you missed any of them, they're online um, on the web link below. Next slide, please. And this is how to access them. Next slide, please. And just a reminder, if you have any questions, if you have any comments, please fill in our survey. We really do appreciate the, the evaluations. They help us choose the topics for future sessions. And uh, we'll, of course, be sending you a session survey, and then you can get your main pro plus credits. Um, and it is nine o'clock now. I do notice there's still quite a few questions. So if, if there are people that want to stick around for a few more minutes, I will cover a few more of those. But otherwise, for those of you that have to, to head off to your clinics, I hope you have a wonderful day um, and a great summer. And uh, for those of you that can stick around for a few minutes, we'll, we'll just tie, tidy up a few more. So maybe could you take down the slides? Okay, so I, I just thought I'd cover a few more because there were just a few clarification questions. Um, I, I think the RSV program is, is new to us. So just some more questions around that, Dan, if you don't mind answering them. Um, so one question in terms of RSV protection, as attendee wrote, I understand that RSV pre-F is available for purchase in pregnancy. Uh, but what about nursimavab, and will pay parents be able to purchase it privately for their infants once born? Yep, so they, they won't have to purchase it privately. The nursimavab before us will be the product we have this year for all infants born in 2024. And same, Abrisvo will be available for any parents who don't wish to get nursimavab for their kids. Great. And a clarification that if you're greater than in terms of catch up Bay Fortis or in terms of Bay Fortis, you children less than two years old or only high risk children need a second dose. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, in terms of the um, patients that pray, that paid for a Brexv last year, can we advise them that they don't need another RSV vaccine this year? Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, and Another question, for patients with due dates in September, would you recommend getting Bay Fortis in October uh, in the clinic later and not in hospital? Yeah, so it it probably won't, we probably won't even have the supply in September, um, so they won't be able to get in hospital. They'll have to come back that month later. It's really depending on, on like when we actually get Bay Fortis in the province. Um, hospitals will be getting the first dose to make sure those newborns are covered. But if they if they make that window, then absolutely they should be coming back the next month whenever they can to get the dose. Great, thanks very much. And just to clarify, all pregnant should be all pregnant patients should be offered the RSV vaccine. So I'll say all pregnant patients should be counseled on both products, Bay Fortis for infants and the vaccine for for pregnant individuals, and Bay Fortis should be strongly recommended as the preferred product that they receive. Okay. If they chose to receive a Brismo, can you give it at the same time as Tdap in pregnancy? Uh, yeah, you, you, you'd be doing the Tdap a little bit later than you normally would. Like Tdap, you can start at, I want to say 28 weeks. I probably should double check that one. Um, but yes, you, you can give it at the same time. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to uh, switch over just to Prevnar for a minute or two. So if a kid has started their series with Prevnar 13, 
um, do we continue with Prevnar 20 or do they need a certain number of Prevnar 15 doses? So if, if they're low risk, then you finish the series with Prevnar 15. If they're high risk with any of those medical conditions, then you finish the series with the, with the 20 instead. Okay, great. Um, and I believe there was another question. So in terms of high risk children who are under the age of six, how many doses of PCV20 should they get? Uh, so for low risk kids on the age of six should be three doses that they're getting. And okay. So be, sorry. For high risk kids that are PCV, that are getting the PCV20. Depend, it depends on if there's immunocompromise or not. They may need additional doses. Um, okay. So I just double check the schedule. Um, you know, if they have severe immunocompromising conditions, there'll be additional doses that are recommended. Okay, great. Um, and then a, a question for infants born in late in 2023 and not high risk. So they didn't get the RSV vaccine and we're going into the second season. My assumption is they would not need the RSV vaccine. No, they, they wouldn't. So they're born in 2023 and not um, they're not covered this year. Again, that's that's because they, number one, would have been through RSV already if they were born in 2023, likely. Um, we're being a little bit extra generous for the January, February births because it does, you know, it fell off pretty quickly last year in terms of RSV in kids, um, where by end of December it was mostly gone. You know, for next year, it will really just be the kids who weren't in a previous RSV season. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, and oh, someone's asking if we can send a one pager. Yes, we'll definitely have to look into how to summarize this in a way that we can all remember it. Uh, and another question is from Jenny is whether pharmacies are going to have any of these funded vaccines similar to the flu vaccines and COVID. Do you know if that's coming? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'll refer to the news release that went out, not yesterday, but the day before that talked about expansion of adult vaccines in pharmacy. Um, so, so pharmacists won't have things like nirsevimab. That's not the case. Um, you know, for those infants, it's not the right place to be getting it. Um, but part of the expansion is looking at the vaccines we give in adulthood, like the pneumococcal vaccines, like the shingles vaccines, for example, as ones that will also be available in pharmacy, along with flu and COVID. Um, it's not immediately happening like tomorrow. This is, you know, the work is happening now to make that expansion possible so that it is a place where those vaccines can be administered. Great, thanks very much. Good to know that they're expanding with the adults to start anyway. Um, in terms of Bay Fortis, I think you said it's not available yet, correct? Not yet. Um, it'll be sometime in October that we get supply and that it starts going up. All right. Um, I think we'll probably just tidy it up now just because we could go on forever, I feel like, <laughs> but uh, I appreciate that we hit you with a number of questions. Um, and thank, uh, we just want to thank you and uh, Zane both for an excellent uh, talk this morning and for introducing us to these new vaccine programs and also updating us on everything that's going on within Ontario in terms of infectious disease. So thanks very much, everybody, and uh, hope everybody has a great weekend.